<laughs> hey DJ, we really gave him the truth on this one, I think it. If you look me in my eyes, you see I'm traumatized Where I'm from is gang banging in them homicides To the decoy Theo street, then we terrorize Suckers have my nigga leaking, but he's still alive If you look me in my eyes, you see I'm traumatized Where I'm from is gang banging in them homicides To the decoy Theo street, then we terrorize Suckers have my nigga leaking, but he's still alive I've been rumbling in the trenches with the apes and gorillas Yeah, it's murder in my section every day, it's a killing Ops trying to kill my nigga, now somebody gotta feel it Caution tape and hella sirens is the only thing I'm hearing Little niggas I go by Tavis Hunter. I'm from South Los Angeles. Um, I grew up on Figueroa. Some of y'all might know as Fig, you know, the Stro. <laughs> but um, yeah, I grew up on um, between Figueroa and Hoover on 68 and Denver. I seen a lot of a lot of good things, and I seen a lot a lot of bad things. So you know, living over here, you get you get a taste of both worlds. But there's not a lot of options where I'm you know coming from. So. It's either you're gonna be a pimp, or you're gonna be a gang member, or you're gonna be a dope dealer. And you know, um, I've seen a lot of people, a lot of people in my family go down those routes, make those bad decisions, and um, I couldn't do it. I mean, I went for a minute. I tried, I tried everything. I tried a little bit of everything, like you know, this, that, that, and none of them stuff was working out for me. And I felt like God was on my side because I did all these things and. I could have been in jail right now. I'm Wapo Cash. I'm from South Central LA, 27 years old, born and raised here. I do tabs for the old time. We go way back, like way, way back, probably since nine, something like that, eight. Nah, we've been through some shit though, man. We've been through some shit. Almost going to jail together. Dodge that bullet. I still went to jail though, later on. I always had the mentality to get your money any way you can, you know what I'm saying? And it kind of fell in my lap. So I was like, fuck it. But since a kid, like, I ain't never thought about having no job. I started getting tattoos early, face tats early. In my mind, I was like, I'm going to be rich, shit. What I need a job for? A job wasn't going to help my mom pay her bills. You know what I'm saying? I ain't had nobody to help us. There wasn't no, no father figure there. I was the father figure to my younger siblings. So I've, I've been off the porch early. My name Reggie, go by Mayhem, uh, from over here too. Grew up, moved like three times on the same block, so I'm a day one from over here. I've been producing and writing for like eight years now. I'm starting to get a hand at a little engineer game, but mostly producing. Um, my siblings, everybody in my family pretty much is musically inclined. Uh, got cousins that DJ, pops DJ, my sister rap, cousins rap. But I just decided to still fit in the music thing, but you know, just do something a little different. My parents raised me and I went wrong on my own. That's the type of stuff, you know what I'm saying? Like, I got into that type of stuff on my own. I'm not easily influenced, so everything that I did, like, it was my choice. As far as the area, you know, typical gang banging, the pimping, you know, the, you know, the regular, you know, low income shit. Shit, man, a lot of pimping and horn, you know what I'm saying? Drug dealing, gang banging, you know what I'm saying? It's the hood, it's the slums right here. You feel me? You got a little bit of everything you gotta watch out for, you feel me? Shit, it been four niggas and died nigga within the last month at the same damn gas station, shit. It's just wicked around here, you know what I'm saying? But if you stay moving, you can't hit a moving target, so you know, I'm always in and out, you feel me? I just stay on the gas, man, that's my method. You know what I'm saying? If you stay moving, man, it's hard to hit a moving target, man. I'm gonna get somewhere about mine, you know what I mean? But uh, can't stay too somewhere too long, you feel me? That's my advice, you feel me? Stay moving, shit. If you wasn't one of them, it's like you were really a nobody. And on top of that, it was like, what were you going to do? We didn't have many options. And then on top of that, um, it's a struggle of you. Everybody's trying to survive. So it's like a bunch of people in one, in one, um, in one place trying to, you know, get out. And when it's like that, you know, things can get very bad because people will do whatever they can or whatever they have to do to get themselves to the next level, whether it's step on toes or whether it's hurt somebody, that's just how it is coming from over here. Oh uh, shit, me getting shot right here. He was he was here. I was right here, got shot. Probably like two months ago. Damn. That's where I got hit at right here, man. If you pay attention, you can see all the all the blood spots from when I was coming down this way. All the way from down here, like 
This shit go far. I was getting my car towed right here. And uh, some people parked in the middle of the street, hopped out, started busting. I ran. I got hit once right here. Kept going. I probably got to this pole right here. And they hit me again. And my artery, my shit started squirting out. And then um, I kept going though. Kept going. My arm was a little locked up with my nerves. Kept going, ran up in the yard, telling Tab, like, hey, open the door. The door was open already. I go up in the house, still squirting blood everywhere, all over the place. That's it, still all the way. The trail leads to the house. They got that little up, little sit up. It show you my, my path when I ran. All up in here. This blood all inside the door still. I had all this shit blood, like. Yeah, man. Went to jail right here. Got out. Came back right here because that's all I know. Got shot. Came back. I'm, you see, I'm back right here. So, yeah, man. That's what happened. It was so much activity going on. I um, I was always afraid of getting shot, you know, because I used to, a lot of my friends got shot. A lot of my friends got killed. Rest in peace, Speedy. Rest in peace, Killer Cam. You know, and all the other people I didn't mention, but those are some of my childhood, you know, those are some of my friends, my good friends, and they're not no longer here no more. And I used to see them, you know, get killed and having to go to funerals and stuff, and I was like, I don't want that to be me. What's going on with it, man? That's the camera. Say something for the camera, man. Let us know what it is. Man, it's a motherfucker dream. It's a motherfucker reality, man. We here. You know how this shit go, man. So I came out of here while I ran, after I ran in here. I told him to tie me up. <laughs> I told him to tie me up. That nigga said, get back, get back. I'm like, call down on what? He like, I'm trying, he looking for his phone. The phone in his hand the whole time. He was tripping, he throw me some sweats, like here. In my mind, I'm like, nigga, I'm supposed to tie this shit up myself. Like, I come back outside, they tie me up. I'm sitting right here waiting. Sitting right here, the police pull up. They like, um, what happened? I'm like, I don't know, I just got shot. They like. You see anything? I'm like, I ain't see nothing. They like, all right, and they leave. Ambulance pull up. I'm sitting right here. They come bring the wheelchair, wheel me to the shit, put me in the ambulance and shit, and then take me off to the hospital. Right to the hospital, they had me downstairs for probably about an hour. And um, they asked me my pain levels and all that. I'm like, it hurt, but that's, it's not killing me. So they like, we gotta put you through a CAT scan to see if we can, um, we can even save you. I'm like, all right, they put me through the CAT scan, bring me back. They said, we're gonna see you to surgery. They sent me to surgery. And um, I asked the surgeon when I get up there, I'm like, like am I gonna live? What it look like? He's like, man, I gotta take a vein out your thigh and put it in your arm because they severed five centimeters of your artery. So I'm like, damn, I'm like, you did this before? He like, no, but I'm one of the best surgeons. In my mind, I'm like, man, you need to tell me if I'm gonna live because I'm up and I'm talking right now. Let me know if I could, if, if, if I'm gonna live or not. So if I'm gonna die, I'm gonna call my people. He like, he like, I got you. So I remember, I just blacked out. I guess they snuck the, uh, the anesthetics in my, in my IV or whatever the case was. So I passed out. I wake up, my mom like, oh my God, like they called me and said you died on the table and you lost too much blood. They had to bring you back, they had to give you a lot of blood. I don't remember none of that, but shit. Luckily, it didn't turn out as a, you know, a rest in peace type thing. It just was a get better, a get well, bounce back type thing. All this shit right here, man. Grew up right here, been through all this shit right here. Just the block for real. I don't know nothing else. You know, I'm from the area, you know what I'm saying? My pops from over here, you feel me? He died right here at a heart attack right in front of his house right here. You feel me? Nigga really from around here. Been coming around here. I didn't stay all around LA, you feel me? But you know, I always come back to the roots, you know what I'm saying? Where a nigga raised, you know what I'm saying, check in, see what's up with my peoples, you feel me? My nigga Tavis, you know what I'm saying? I know his mom's his whole family. Other people might say it's a struggle, but for me it was regular because I was immune to this shit, but you know, I don't blame where I come from, you know, I'm just trying to go farther, you know what I mean? But uh 
Yeah, coming up in the hood, shit. It was fun, shit. You ask me, I don't know nothing else. So shit, you know, it is what it is. You gonna be in the documentary? Get out the car and I'll bust the club. Weird ass nigga. You gonna fuck me up? Take, I'm a popular hoe while you recording me. Hey, nobody give a Shut fuck up, about bitch. that. Shut the fuck up, stupid you ass up, bitch. You get your fat ass out the car. You get you your fat ass out the car, bitch. Don't eat them Twinkies while that fucking cellulite on your legs. Yeah. My name is Michael Howell, you know, from LA, South Central. You know, I grew up born and raised. Family Jamaican, you know, we grew up hard living. You know, shit, we hustled to survive on the block. You know, I grew up on 68th in Denver. From rolling 60s, though, but, you know, I grew up over here on Denver. This is where I was born and raised. Shit, we hustled, we watched prostitutes, we robbed niggas, shit, shoot dice, smoke weed, we done pieced up on stress bags, shit, flip bitches, slept in the same house. His mama know my mama. You know, Nick can't say too much, but, you know, he know what time it is. <laughs> and... You know, um, I did a lot of different things. You know, I had to try to figure myself out. I, I tried this, I tried that, I tried that. And, you know, I can honestly say, like, none of them was really for me. And why, what I can say that is because it's like, I didn't, I didn't enjoy none of it. And I knew what I wanted to do. I always had a passion for music. And once I first heard myself on the microphone, after that point, Everything else that I was trying to do, it didn't, it didn't even phase me. I remember spending hours and hours and hours in the house in my bedroom when I had my first studio, which is I was living on 59th and Figueroa at the time, and I couldn't have much company over there because the house was so small. But you know, my moms and pops they were going through some things, and we were trying to figure you know things out. We wasn't you know poor or anything like that, but you know the lifestyles my mom and pops lived. It wasn't just easy for them to just to jump inside of a home, you know, and move and stuff like that because, you know, you know, it was a lot. They did a lot. And um, so, you know, to make a long story short, I never went I never went without anything. My mom's and my, my father made sure I had whatever I wanted, no matter what our living conditions were. I I was happy, I had everything I could think of. Every time I asked for something, I didn't have a problem with getting it. Just had to make sure that I went to school every day and Try my best. That was their only, you know, um, requirements. So I did what I could. I wasn't um, the smartest kid in the, you know, in the school, but you know, I feel like I came out pretty decent. Yeah. Yeah. She's like, yeah, I didn't know you. I seen your Instagram. I didn't know you rap. So I'm like, yeah. She said, yeah, I seen your old Instagram. I said, yeah, I be doing some stuff. I'm working on a documentary right now. Hell yeah. All the joints. She's like, where Mike? Where Mike? I didn't know you know Mike. Yeah, man, you know, man, we trophy bro. LA, man, is a small city. We known out here, bro. Yeah, for sure. And who was it? He said, you want to know who it was. I don't know, man. My brother just replied to the story, man. Mm. My name is Famous, Famous Coleon. I grew up a uh, block before Fig, 68th and Denver to be exact. Um, how can I put it up? You know, this block been birthed a lot of, uh, it's come from a lot, lot, lot of legacy, you know, uh, you know, a lot of uh, go-getters, you know what I'm saying? A lot of real street niggas been raised within these premises between Fig, on fig between Gage and Florence. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, you know, it's a dope zone. But it's good, though. You know, it's like a, it's a small community. You know, we all come up from, we all sandbox kids. So we all love each other like brothers. And um, we had a lot of fun. You know, throughout my life, we had a lot of fun. And I could tell you, like, it was things like my mom, She every time she would get some money from somewhere or she would make a big play and make a lot of money, she would come, she'd be like, you know what, we're going to such and such, we're going to Raging Waters, we're going to, to this water park, or we're going to go buy you a dirt bike, or, you know, it was just a lot of things she was just always wanted to do for me. And, um, you know, coming up, when you were one of those kids that always, you know, got the parents that always want to do something and you always got everything. You know, it's kind of hard to keep friends. It was hard. It was very hard, hard for me to keep friends. And um, 
it wasn't my fault. It was, you know, I just had parents that just did for me, and you know, in the in the um in the in in the, in the environment that I was I was in the environment that I was brought up in, I um you know, it wasn't a lot of people on this street that had a lot, but there were a few people, you know, them parents that gave them that gave them just as much as my parents gave me, you know, but. There was some over here that didn't have it, you know, that wasn't as, you know, unfortunate enough to have everything that we had. And, you know, the street that I come from, everybody had something going on. So your parents, if you, if, if you, if your, if your parents lived on Denver, everybody was involved in something. Everybody was um, getting some type of money. And the kids, you know, the kids that were over here, like myself and my brothers and, and the neighbors and stuff, everybody kind of had the same thing. Like when we had go-karts. They had go-karts. So we were all riding up and down the street on go-karts. Then when electric scooters came around, we were all on electric scooters. And, you know, every, whatever the, the trend was at that time and whatever the new thing that was out at that point, we had it. So I'm not going to say everybody did, but a lot of us on the street did have it. And um, we had a lot of fun. Well, <laughs> yeah, uh, we were riding around the area, wetting everybody with water guns and stuff. I'm trying to walk to school, summer school. He roll up, want to squirt me in my face or whatever. So I chased him down and I ended up just throwing his bike in the middle of the street. That's actually how we got cool. Like, it's kind of weird. You know what I'm saying? Like, we didn't really have no big, that was like our big first interaction. Just him fucking with me. And then I think later on that day, his mom came to holler at my mom. But it was like no, no friction after that. Like, we was cool. Like, I still say what's up. So say what's up or whatever. What are you doing, nigga? Since you was a baby, man. I'm talking about I was the youngest nigga over here with a go kart. Yeah. I'm talking about like 90, 95, 96. He was a baby, but the man had a heart of a line. Shit, man. Me and Tavis, well, shit. Me and Tavis, we always, every time I knew Tavis, we always know some player shit since we was young. So, majority of the time I was with him, we probably was like with some females or trying to get into something. Majority of the time he done did some crazy shit. Now he got hella weed and passing us out weed. You know, we done been through hella shit. We done, yeah, I don't even want to say too much. You hear me? <laughs> <laughs> you know the truth. You feel me? This is my, I really grew up with him. Like, I ain't just meet this nigga. It's like my real childhood friend, you know? He a good nigga, he a good person, he a good individual. Shit, I'll be happy to see all this shit. That's why I come around, really. You know, just for, you know, that shit like a, like a, like a motivation. Like, you know, it's, that's some real nigga shit. You see somebody you grew up with, like on some a different path. Majority of all our homies in jail. Niggas got a hell of time. Niggas didn't get no pot on the hand. You know, we all got banged out. Everybody I'm pretty sure he grew up with. Cause it's the same niggas, you know? So shit to see him on his shit on some not square, but it's different, you know, it's legally, so it's shit, nigga respect it, you feel me? Oh, that's it. Shit. A lot of things that's going down today is because it, you know, my little bro, he's uh He's a real entrepreneur. He do his motherfucking thing. He put on it for his motherfucking city. You hear me? That little nigga solid, man. I love that little nigga. It's like my little brother. Seeing a nigga grow up to, from a pup to a motherfucking German Shepherd. You hear me? Hey, bro. I think we was about 14. I want to say about 13, 14. We was young, bro. Shit, uh, I seen this fucking house, fucking. And it was open, but I was like kind of scared because I knew who the people was that was in our neighborhood and shit. And this nigga oh, Tavis coming down the street with a dog. I'm telling him, bro, what's up, bro? We finna make some money, bro. I gotta play right now. But it was like a person, you feel me? Like, it was some shit. It was deeper than what it was. And shit, we bust a little play, shit. It was, it was cool, shit. Oh, yeah, shit. Oh, what's up, nigga? I'm looking like, who is this, man? Hey, oh, what's going on with it, man? Yeah, everything yeah, good? Yeah, man. Yeah. This, this, I'm doing a documentary, oh, man. Shit. Taking something oh, for the shit. camera, Sorry. man. Sorry. What up, man? What up, what up? Put him out of, put him out of. That's my boy right there. Yeah, That's my boy Junior right there. Hey, Junior. Hey, Junior. What's up, man? Yeah, yeah. The BMW. What's happening, Junior? Yeah, I remember. We're doing a documentary, yeah. man. Say something for the camera, What's man. What's up, man? Um, Westside nigga 68, nigga. We saying this shit. I'm walking down the street, and I see this nigga. He's talking about, hey, bro, come here, come here, come here. So I'm like, I'm walking my dog and shit. I'm just, you know, yeah. doing what kids do. So I get down the street, he like, man, I need you to help me real quick. Help you. I said, okay, I got the dog. He said, yeah, stay right here. Let me know if somebody come. And we're like, I'm so I'm standing in the front, I got this big ass white dog. Now mind you, I'm the only motherfucker on the street with this big ass white dog. It's a big, it's not like a regular dog, it's just like a dog in a movie. Like you would think it's like some 
like a wolf, not a wolf. Like it was a great pair of knees. So after that, you that know what I'm saying? He come out, you know, I got a dog. He come out running out with all these shit, PlayStations and all this and all that. And I said, oh man, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> he said, and that might just take off running different ways. I'm running down the street with this big ass dog. Yeah. We was kids we though, was you know? Kids. We did hella crazy man, shit. Man, I'm talking about, man. And I'm talking about, I'm, I'm just walking the dog and ended up on the lit. Me and the dog. I was the nigga that really you know bring the bitches over here. That's the nigga I was. Yeah, getting, you know, having different females every day, every other day. Smoking, drinking, partying, all the way to six in the morning. When I was about 18, I'm 24 right now, but 18, man, we was living that rock star life, man. Partying every day, man, going out, man. Studio time, you took me to a few shows, like it's been crazy, man. It's like a big brother to me, low key. Okay. This nigga, right? He would go to the weed shop. And I always want to say this nigga because he black. Okay? <laughs> weed from Dr. Him. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm gonna tell you how, the, how his name Sauce came about, right? He was all over you all the time. We would always go out and shit. But we would always be casual. You know, we'd be casual, whatever it is. And this motherfucker come, he will come in a Versace shirt we ain't never seen before. 12, 13, 14, 1500 dollars shirts and shit. And we like, God damn, where you going to Miami? You know, so <laughs> so he always had the flavor, you know what I'm saying, the drip. So we used to call him, you know, that's how he got the name, that's Sauce. The name. And, mm -hmm. you know, every day it'd be different females over here every day. Like, when one group of females wasn't with what we was trying to get with, we kicked them out, call a whole nother group. And if they wasn't looking too right, then we would call another one. Now, a mm. couple, of, couple, couple of these dudes had to take one for the team. For sure, if these know, if I'm coming from school or whatever, I was the person that was going, like, bro, I got these bitches, they rolling right now. And it's gonna put everybody to see who gonna be with the shit. You know, I made a few niggas lose their virginities and shit. <laughs> we ain't gonna say no name. Oh man, I remember when I met Tav. When I met Tav, uh, it was through his pops. My dad, my dad brought me over here. My dad and his dad were, were buddies. And, um, you know, like my dad would bring me over here. I would always see him. They're like, oh, you know, Tav got a studio in the back. He would always be, you know, he bumping beats whenever I came in here. Like we, you know, have a little freestyling, you know, little little sessions. And then from there, it was like we started recording. He called me over one time, and like my dad brought me. When he played, he played a song, uh, "I'm So Hood." And like from there, it was like the feeling I got, you know what I mean, from that song alone. And it was like it was just it was a different feeling for me, where it was like I was already, you know, singing and doing music since I'm a little bit older. But he just. To be able to have a place where you can always be natural and be able to, you know, put out that craft is different. Right. Yeah, I, you know, ended up buying my first keyboard from him, and then that's when I got, you know, slowly into music. I had a laptop. Uh, I got reasons from him too, the beat making program. So I bought my my keyboard and the program from him. You know, started you know getting into the whole music game, and then you know once I found out he had the studio, I come down here every so often with my sister and my cousins. And then uh, after that, I just start being a regular mom. Every day, he rides by the Infinities and shit. That's an uncle Infinity. That's a black one. That nigga, that nigga, that nigga, that nigga used to be. I remember the two door. Man, look. The pass out the two door. Pass out the two door, bro. Nigga had a door open ready for him. Three niggas. Both niggas. You know, the seat had to slow when it move up because it's electric. Yeah, that was the car, though. That's why we had G-Lux, man. It's so crazy because he had so much going on. Man, we would go pull up on females and shit like that. I had to be home at a certain time because I had school in the morning. This nigga, he was grown. You know what I'm saying? We the same age, but he was grown, though. He was grown. He was grown. Doing whatever the fuck he wanted to do. I'll pull up on my mom over here. Like, what's the deal? Like, we don't even live together. Like, what's up, mom? You doing? Hey, hungry. Dry up. Yeah. So I grew up, man, I went to this uh, elementary school right here. My grandparents used to stay right here. And, um, you know, I used to run up and down here on little go-karts, golf carts, anything that rode, I was on it, you know? And um, this is where it started, you know? This is where it started, right here in this house. Like I said, my grandparents, my mom, her sisters, my whole family started here. And then it just branched out. We moved down the street. We were living, we was living down there for maybe about five to six years, I believe. Then we moved away. Actually, we were stand on 71st, 73rd at Hoover, and then we moved away after that. Then we moved over here, and then stayed here a couple years, and then we moved to 80. What's that? Damn, I forgot what, what we were stand at. Um, 59th. We were stand on 59th and Hoover, and before that, it was 48th and Hoover. So we were. My parents was having a tough time finding a place to live. It wasn't a money issue or nothing like that, but it was just the fact that you know. Um, you know, just was having a, you know, finding somebody that'll rent you somewhere. It's not like you can just walk into a place and then somebody's gonna be like, here, you can live in this home. So they had to find some stuff and, um, 
you know, we had a lot of uh, trials and tribulations on the way, but what we ended up at, I can say that the, you know, the road was well worth it. This whole block, every nigga in this motherfucker hit different. So I'm saying this family, it's not no shit that been put together two, three years. So I'm saying this sandbox shit. But it's beautiful though. You know, like brothers, we argue, we fight. You know what I'm saying? But we don't let that shit hit the public. We make up and we get over that shit like men. So, you know, that's all we produce, man. Young men around here trying to make this shit happen. Good way, bad way. Crying pace, you hear me? <laughs> so, yeah. You know, in this area right here, like I always said, it was either three options. Either you was going to be a gangbanger, you're going to be a pimp, or you're going to sell drugs. It ain't really uh, too many different... Uh, other things out here to do. Oh. Now we only huddled in love because we about to go to dinner, so that's the only reason we out here. Oh no, no, we live. <laughs> <laughs> It used to be cool to walk up and down the street. It used to be cool to, you know, hang out and stuff like that. But right now, as y'all can see, it's been bad. It's like uh, four people got killed in the last month at the same place. So, you know, um, the, it's changed. It's really changed over here. Ain't nothing the same. It's not how like it was when I was a kid. That's why I'm trying to get my stuff and get from up over here because they ain't got nothing over here I want. I mean, I love it. I'll never forget where I came from, but, you know, it's dangerous over here, so. We gonna cut for now, we gonna get away from here. Too many suspicious cars walking by, so we gotta make it happen. We can't be to one spot too long. Grew up in Hyde Park, um, borderline South Central Inglewood area. Um, so for me, it was like, you know, I had my, my moms running the streets, pops running the streets, you know. Moms was more structured, you know, trying to create a life, um, working multiple jobs. My dad, you know, street hustler, multiple, you know what I mean, revenues, but, you know, I, I fell on my grandma a lot, you know, for her. So she was there to help me push, you know, stay along, you know, my path, even though I had a lot of, you know, rough patches, but shit's been cool, you know. Man, I remember days like, where like my pops, he would leave me with like a stack of money, like fat ass stack of money and be like, if I don't make it home tonight, call your grandma, you know what I mean? Like, so I feel like as a, as a child, like that stuff kind of stuck with me, you know what I mean? It's like wanting things for yourself and uh, not really sure how to, you know, structure it and get it for yourself. I know how you're going to get it, but having a mindset of like, like that little kid was saying on Instagram, you're like, uh, I want a lot of money. I just want to have it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's like, you know, as time goes on, you know, you start to structure things for yourself and see what you actually, you know, feel is more comfortable for your route. You know what I mean? Man, the struggles, man. The, I've been through some, some real traumatizing things. Like, man, you know, losing my mom four years ago, losing my father four months ago, you know, it's been a tough on me. But you know, when I lost my mom, a lot of things in my life changed, like, like changed big, big. And it made me into a different person. It changed the way I feel, it changed the way I look at life every day. And you know, um, it took a toll on me. Like when I say I lost a part of me, when I lost my mom, I did, I lost a part of me. I lost the half of my heart, you know? And I didn't know what I was gonna do once that had happened. Once that happened, I got the news. I immediately, I was in Las Vegas at the time, um, hustling, trying to find my way. And when I got the call, well actually I didn't get the call. When I seen it on TMZ, I said, wait a minute, it says rest in peace on TV. I'm like, what? You know, I was sitting at the table and I'm just looking. I was with my two cousins and um, I was confused. I'm like, what? So I call, I call my father and um, my father says, uh, oh no, your mom's not dead. She just 
uh, had a heart attack and they had to put a stent inside her heart. I said, well, why nobody called me? They was just saying, well, um, because we didn't know how, how, how bad it was going to be. At the, uh, we didn't know how serious it was. We didn't, you know, it's not like that. And okay, it's not like that. Then he calls me back 30 minutes. He said, you know what? You might want to come back home because it's not looking good. I said, damn, this, everything's happened so fast. So at that immediately, I dropped to my knees. And, you know, I was standing up on the phone. I walked outside. And I was on the phone talking to my dad and I just immediately fell on my knees. Like I was standing straight up and just dropped. Like it's like I lost every every um every feeling in my legs. Like I lost the feeling in my legs because I um I couldn't stand that. And um what he was telling me I didn't want it to believe it was true. So um you know, I had a little apartment out there. I was getting in the process of getting me a home and stuff to stay in out there. But in the process, I was in a weekly out there. And, you know, from people that, you know, is, is from Las Vegas and, you know, in the weeklies, you know how, you know, they know what it is. They know what, what time it is when you're living in the weeklies. But, you know, the rent was $300 a week. It started off at 400 a week. Then it went to 300 a week. And it's like the longer you be there, the more, um the cheaper it gets but anyway make a long story short I was there so I moved out of my apartment in one hour I had an apartment out there I moved out in one hour I took all my stuff I packed it everything I can get in my car everything that you know was the most valuable things to me I packed it in my car and everything else I just let everybody have it like everybody that was in that um, complex I was standing I just gave away brand new furniture and stuff because I knew I wasn't coming back and I knew that um, it wasn't um wasn't looking good and at that point it kind of made me hate las vegas after that because i experienced the you know one of the toughest times in my life one of the hardest pills i ever had to swallow was in las vegas every time i go to las vegas i think i'm gonna get a call but you know neither one of my parents are here no more so it's like i can kind of sleep better but at the same time i heard every day Oh, okay. okay, can you hear this one to me, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't want you to go in my purse or nothing. And tell June, no, tell Tavis. Okay, no, see, no, tell my sons and them. I love them. Okay, so in case I don't make it out of this one. All right. All right. Is that it? Uh, yeah, that's it. All right. Bye. The most memorable things about my mom. Man, I could tell you a lot. I could write a whole book. But the most was getting cussed out. Like, if I didn't get cussed out, I didn't feel like I was loved. You know, because I got cussed out ever since I was a kid. So it was just like natural. And she didn't mean no harm by it. She never, you know, um, said it to make me feel, you know, make you feel bad or nothing. It was just how she talked. And everything was motherfucker. Motherfucker this, motherfucker that. Get the fuck out of here. Uh, uh, you know, I fuck, fucked her, I fuck her up, or shut the fuck up, like shit like that, you know, and that was just the way she talked, you know, and um, when she wouldn't cuss, then you know that, you know, something would be wrong, because she would always cuss, I mean, every other word that come out of her mouth was a cuss word. Alright, so what are we working on now? Okay, we finna do this right here, if you don't have no, um, um, Crescent rolls, you can use any kind of cheap ass donuts or whatever, it don't matter. So you do the same thing, spread some on there, okay? This is butter, sugar, and cinnamon, okay? Put a lot of sugar in it so it tastes real good for the, for the kids and shit, okay? Then you put your a little raisins on one side. This is donuts you're making? No, nigga, this is, I, I don't know what the fuck this is, okay? It's just something sweet for the fucking kids, okay? Damn, you, you gotta stay with me now, shit. Then you smash it out like that there. Smash that out. You got to pick him up really easy because you don't want... Make sure all the edges are smashed so the shit don't seep out. Do the same thing to this one over here. Same. It's, it's that prison food. No, this is not no prison... Motherfucker, this is not prison food, okay? Now, I'm going to get me You making everything from no, scratch? No, I got to get me a fucking camera because... A cameraman because you tripping. Okay, same way with this one here. But no, I'm not going to put no uh, raisins in this one. A person might be allergic to them or something. You take that there. You do it like that. Hold up. See there? See it's all closed up on the edges? See there? You pick them up and you go over here. Come on. Come on. And you drop them in there. Grease got to be hot, hot. So they'll be able to cook right away. 
Okay, see that? So on the last video we just put up, what, what, what was that? That was Crescent Rose. Okay. What do you okay. call that? I don't know. Is it something for them kids, you know? You keep saying something for yeah, the kids. Yeah, but what is a dessert? So, yeah. when they, so when they come ask for God it. God damn it, I ain't got no motherfucking name for it yet, motherfucker. So Shit. when they come ask for it, what they going to say? Can you? Can we have some of those something for the kids? Well, uh, uh, okay, well, you right about that there. What so you got to you gotta have a name okay, for them. Um, um, ain't feed sweet stuff. Uh, I put sweet trees. Well, well, you know what? It could just be a, a, a apple, t not an apple turnover, but a, a raisin turnover. Mm -hmm. How about that? Just a raisin turnover. That's all. Just it, it's just gotta so be a, done, a raisin right? turnover. Yeah, they done. Okay, they, but they don't have to get that dark, yeah. but they do. Yeah. I mean, but, why are you uh, making that dark for? Well, because I'm uh, you messing with me. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. See, that I didn't mean for me to get that dark. Now you know what? Feet don't burn a damn thing, and you done. But that's good though. Oh, I'm going to have to do another one. Come on here. Come on, I'm going to have to do another one. Yeah, because you didn't. Yeah, I'm going to have to do another one. Hold on. Get the biscuit out like this here. Actually, I don't give a damn if it's broke. It don't matter. You smash him out the way you want to smash him out. Like that there. Okay? Pick him up so he don't stick. Do it like that there. Put some shit in the middle of him. Okay? Like that. Fold him. You can fold him like this here. Roll him. And then it'd be like a, a, a cinnamon roll, but... Close up each edge. Uh, um, pull him a little bit, okay? Mm -hmm. Look at the damn food, okay? Shit. Pull him a little bit like yeah, that. There. I got it on the Come camera. On. What are you talking like about? Now that's like a little old punk ass cinnamon roll. Oh, they got a testito. Well, yeah. Oh, no, it ain't a testito. And, I, and I'm going to do uh, some chicken later on. Okay, so you got chicken coming later yeah, on. Yeah, but you are gonna learn how to do something. How about that? So tell them, tell them what you tell them to stay tuned in for the video that you got coming later on today, which okay. is gonna be what? Uh, baked chicken. Okay. Baked chicken, baked chicken, and you don't have to cook it right now. Okay. Baked chicken. Let me get my plate. So baked about chicken. about what time should they be tuning in with you? Uh, I don't even know. Mm -hmm. So they, just, I don't let them know too much about me because then they'd be ready to, you know, come and do something and shit. But now this is would be cute right so, here. So basically, they need to just watch everything you post. Yeah, yeah. Now let's go over here and light so we can see this here. Look, okay. Look. See this right here? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna get all that on there. See, look. Mm -hmm. I love. Come on, get close up on it. See? Break it. See all the shit running out? Woo! Shit, that's butter and sugar that melt it. Okay. It's hot though. Huh. And look. Look, see that right there? Yeah. Something fell out. I don't want none of it. But no, no. You take it and you wipe it because I ain't nothing but butter and sugar. Mm -hmm. And put it on there. Mm -hmm. Ain't you like that? No, this one? No, this one. See that? Yeah. See that? I'm low. Bummy, but shit, it's good though. Alright, cop, that's it. Uh, his mom's was uh all hands on, you know what I mean? She was very uh very real, you know, authentic, straightforward and shit. Oh man, she gonna give it to you raw, you know what I'm saying? She ain't gonna put no sugar on it, you feel me? Yeah man, she really made me, you know what I'm saying, step my shit up, you know they was calling me the national. She, she used to you know, say, you California brown nigga, you ain't been nowhere, you know, so she made me get somewhere about my name, you feel me? Make a nigga live up to it, you feel me? Yeah, she could person that heart. Yeah, so. I can take it back to the early 90s, man. Um, I used to ride my bike down in this house. That's when we stayed on like 7, 7, on, on the corner of Denver, 7. Corner by the school, I used to ride. Knock on the gate, Auntie Fee used to let me in, you know, talk her shit. You know, we was badasses back then. Uh, it was an investment. Get a good place too, cause them people gonna be trying to uh, have sex with your name. I'ma tell you, <laughs> they be all over your damn name and shit. I'm telling you, get a good one. Is that a good one right there? Yeah, I said, love you, auntie. That's don't Chris. let nobody fuck with. That's Chris motherfucking ass. That's Chris, and this is his. Uh, is this your auntie Rob? He's the homie. It's like medicine, tomato salad on top of your head. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that. Chris, I don't want to get in the car. I ain't got the keys. Who's got the keys? The white man. You scared somebody gonna take it from you? No, it's, it's a good neighborhood. They ain't gonna do nothing. No, I like you. You know what I'm saying? I like you. You is my baby. You is my baby. You so like good. You got no motherfucking sense. You already know. Tell him we pray. Let me tell you something. Why 
I want to be one of your bodyguards. No, I'm going to tell you about your bodyguard. Okay? We ain't got none. Wait, I'm going to tell you which ones to get, okay? Which ones? Get them motherfuckers from the hood. Whatever fucking hood you're from, get them. You know what? Hey, they got them bodyguards you can buy from that company. That don't work. That don't work. Because the minute the motherfucker put a pistol on your fucking ass, the they motherfucker's going to run. Gonna run. <laughs> <laughs> they sign up for this Tell whole shit. I'm telling you. I've been telling you. real this shit, man. I'm telling you. Go on and get me. All right. All right. <laughs> Thank Who you, are baby. you, baby? Braze. Braze? How you doing, baby? Mm. Okay. All right. This is Zoom Braze. I don't want them names. What they name? Braze. Braze. This bitch lying. That bitch was lying on you? Yeah, they do. Where your shit at? And you ain't lost it. Lost Who are you? I'm Spice. Mr. Spice said they got a bunch of nieces and shit like that there. Stacy, I want you to see this one. Oh, 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 oh. Who is this How you doing? I'm JC the Barber. JC the Barber. This is JC the Barber. Okay? Please, my <laughs> shit done too. How are you, Mama? Who are you? Hi, I'm Drea. Drea? Mm -hmm. One of these, these blue wheels? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I got a job. I'm good. All right, pleasure to meet you all. All right, busy. Nice to meet you, man. Yeah. My mom, she will always, you know, she always wanted the best of everything. She never tried to keep up with the Joneses, but she did like the top-notch shit. And what I mean by that is, like, if she's going to get a car or whatnot, she's going to make sure she wants the baddest car it is. Like, I remember her last Escalade she bought um, years ago. Um, she said she wanted the one off the showroom floor. The guy kept trying to take them out, take her outside and show her something that was older than that. She says, no, I want this one. The man said, well, this is not even out yet. He comes, you know, this is a year before it's time. She said, I still want it. How much is it? So my dad and my mom in there, they looking like they don't got no money. Because my dad has on a ripped shirt with coffee stains and shit on it. Um, my mom, she came in there with, you know, just some house clothes you walk around the house with. And... She walked in there and they were just, they didn't think, you know, it was, but my daddy had $30,000 in his pocket. So, you know, um, you know, to, to, uh, to put down on something and, you know, he could have cashed it out. I mean, they, they were getting money at the time. So money wasn't a thing. Like it was, you know, it was plentiful, but, um, you know, m you know, you had to show for things and my, my parents didn't have jobs and stuff, so they couldn't really do, you know, as big as they wanted to do, but they did it. So, you know, they go inside, so the guy, my, my dad says, um, my dad says, uh, well, I'll, I'll put 15000 down right now. He, the man says, okay, well, we can't find nobody to finance you. So they've been good. They were sitting there for hours trying to find somebody to finance them. And there's 30 grand, I mean, there's 30 grand there, but he's willing to drop fifteen. So he says, uh, oh, well, it's okay. If you can't find nobody, it's all right, we'll leave. So he picks up all the money off the table, but he picks it up slow. And, you know, I guess they look at it like, oh, are we really going to let, you know, this 15 grand walk out the door? So they get one block away from the place and the people are blowing up their phones. Ooh, hey, come back, come back, come back. We got somebody that'll finance you. Bring the money back. Oh, yeah. So they bring the money back. $15,000. It was fully loaded, sunroof and everything. Mama said, I want that one. She didn't want nothing. If it was outside, she wanted that. And that's the type of person she was. If she said she was going to do something, she was going to do it. And the way she raised me and my brothers and stuff, like one thing my mom, she used to get mad a lot because we, I used to say, oh, we can't, that's expensive. We can't afford that. She would say, uh-uh. She didn't look at me. So she never say, we can't afford nothing. She said, I could buy any motherfucking thing I want and anything you want. She said, there ain't nothing too expensive. She said, if I want, I'm going to get that bitch. And that's how she talked. His pops was always calm and collected, you know, respectful. Pops is just OG, man. Like, I never uh, really, like, he was always around, you know what I mean? But it's like, he just looked out for me in a sense, hey, you good? You know what I mean? In a sense like that, but just always made sure I felt love when I was around, you know what I mean? This is a touchy subject for me. Why? Because I was sick with COVID uh, for 17 days. I was inside the house, and I didn't come out for 18, 17 to 18 days. I was in the house and I was in and out the hospital for, you know, every other day because I was feeling so bad. And I was very, very sick. I was like, when I say sick, I never felt the way I felt at that time. And people asked me like, um, what was it like? I said, I would rather die than to catch COVID again. And I'm just sick. I'm just being serious uh, because that's how sick I was. And I felt like nobody could help me, you know, at the time. Like I was throwing up, I was vomiting for, seven to eight days straight every day all day non-stop just 
vomiting. And there's nothing, I can't eat nothing, I can't drink nothing. And I was so sick. And, you know, everybody in the house, you know, was trying to help me. And um, I kind of felt bad because I should have came and, and, and laid in my man cave instead of, you know, uh, risking everybody else's health. But I swear I was so sick, I didn't want to be alone. And I went back and forth to the hospital and my dad was just telling me, please don't go to the hospital because I can't come in there and see you. Can't nobody be there with you because of this, you know, of, of this sickness that's out. And I said, you know, I understand. I said, but I have to go. I said, I'm sick. I, I, you know, and when he was talking to me, begging me not to go, I started throwing up in the kitchen, in the kitchen uh, trash can. And I was like, I can't do this. Like, I'm, this is all day. And, um... After that, I beat the COVID, you know, I was after, the, after my third day at the hospital, second day at the hospital, I'm sorry, the, the, the doctor was saying, oh, you back again? They ran tests on me. The first day I was there, they didn't. They said I tested um, negative for COVID. Then the next day I came out, which I was sicker, I came in there with a fever of 105, 104, something like that, something crazy. So they just took off all my clothes and told me to sit outside. I had to break my fever. They couldn't do anything to. They couldn't do anything for me until they broke my fever. I had a hundred and fever of 105, and I was sitting there and I was outside just shivering, like really cold. But my fever was too high. They couldn't give me no medication. They couldn't do nothing. So after that, um, once my fever came down, they gave me a, a, a cocktail, a bunch of these uh, drugs and shit to put in my system. Once they did that, they said they're gonna get me feeling better. I was so dehydrated. They had two IV bags going on me at one time. Two of them. And then I needed another one after that because I was so down. I, I told them, I said, I haven't ate in about nine days. I haven't ate or drunk anything in nine days. So they start, uh, I said, everything, I, I throw up everything. So they give me, um, they give me, what did they give me? They gave me something to set on my stomach. I think it was a morphine or something. And um, they set on my stomach. They gave me a cracker. They told me to eat the cracker and some applesauce. Ate that shit. I was feeling good. As soon as I get back home, I start vomiting and getting sick again. So it was a, you know, it was a, it was a tough situation. And before I had even went to emergency room, I paid to speak to a doctor on FaceTime. It cost me about two to three hundred bucks just to talk to a doctor, cause you couldn't go in nowhere. And I wanted to speak with somebody to find out what the fuck was going on because I was fucked up. And you know, I talked to the doctor on the phone, and she wrote me a prescription through the through the uh, FaceTime call. I mean, through the video call. And she said, you know, you might need to go see uh, to emergency room because you don't look well. And I said, she's like, you got all the symptoms of COVID. This is before I knew I had it. But I was throwing up all on the video call, talking to her every few seconds. So she just gave me some stuff to set on my stomach and all of that. And, um, I, you know, um, eventually, you know, I kept going back to the house, the emergency room. Doctor said, look, the last time I was there, he said, you're at the point to where I, there's nothing, nothing, nothing more I can do for you. He said that um, you don't know if you're going to come out of this situation. And he said that um, you just have to help your body fight and pray that, you know, you you can you make it. He said, because right now he's like, if you come back and, you know, this is time I was getting worse. I had um, my COVID had turned into pneumonia. So I had, you know, I was diagnosed with COVID and pneumonia in my lungs. So that was a very bad experience for me right there. And, you know. My father having to see me go through that every day, I knew it took a toll on him because he was trying everything in his power not to get sick. He was like sawing the house down, he would walk around the house with masks, he would give me stuff, but he wouldn't come directly over there to me and put it on the table, come get it, just so, you know, he wouldn't get sick because he's a diabetic, so he knew that if he caught it, it would eventually be bad. He would always say, like, you know, keep your mask on, you know, try not to go too many places because... I'm older. He, my daddy was 50. My daddy was 60 something, and he said that um, my body can't take it. He said, "I know if I catch it, I, you know, I, I, I I'm not gonna be able to handle it. I'm looking at what you go through. It's, I don't want this." So I understand, and you know, I got better after 17 days, and um, he got sick the next day after my, I was able to, you know, get back and do for myself. He got sick, and I tried to do everything I could to take care of him. I was buying soups. I spent hundreds of hundreds and two hundred dollars at grocery stores on Instacart having food delivery here, suits and all kind of stuff so I was just trying to keep him hydrated drinking uh, water Gatorade and everything because I knew what would happen because I've been through it so eventually 
he got like me, he, he stopped taking stuff. He couldn't drink, he couldn't eat nothing, and um, it just was getting bad. So he only lasted four days. It killed him in four days, like it took him down. And he was like, you know, we're on day three. I can do this, I can do this. And he was motivated and he had got so happy because uh, our jobs told us that the vaccines were, were available. And when we signed up, people had crashed it. So it was like, we were in a waiting list now. And he was, then he got depressed. He's like, oh man, we're not gonna be able to get the vaccine. So we were so happy to get it. But, um, you know, he, he couldn't hold on. He couldn't hold on no longer. And um, I went inside the bedroom and he was laying on the floor. And, you know, uh, good thing I had walked past his bedroom because he had forgot. He, he didn't know where his phone was at. Um, he couldn't call nobody for help. So I just had to look in the room and I noticed that I couldn't open the door. I said, what the hell wrong with the door? He talking about, I'm right here. I said, what's wrong with you? He says, I said, how you get on the floor? He said, I was trying to lay back down. I said, he had got up. I said, you know, you should have called me. I told you to call me when you ready. And, you know, after that, I tried to pick him up. And he was just like dead weight. He couldn't help me help, help himself. So I was going to take him to Harvard General. Why? Because I already knew that he had heart problems here and there. But I knew that if he was at Harvard General, they have a, a on on on, on um on call heart specialists that are always there. So, you know, if he has a heart attack or anything, I feel like he would have been in the best of care. So I was trying to take him in my car, but I couldn't. So he had to go in the ambulance and the ambulance take him to bullshit ass uh Centinella. A lot of people die in Centinella. Like that is you do not want to go there. And you know, when I got there, well actually when he, he got there, he called me, he said, you know, I'm inside now, I'm doing a be a breathing treatment, I'm feeling better. I said, okay. He said, I'll call you back once I'm done with this treatment. So I get a call back at five, in the, five o'clock in the morning. And the lady said, you know, your father passed away. So he passed away, but I just talked to him. And that was all she said. It put me in a depression for a minute because like I clinged, I clenched on to my father once I lost my mom. Cause it was like, when you lose one parent, you don't want to go back and lose the other. You don't want, you want to try everything in your power to keep one because man, you, that hurt. If you haven't never, if you never lost your parent, you, you would never understand the hurt that it comes with. And me and my dad, you know, we begin to get really, really close. Cause I was close with my mom a lot, but I was, my dad always been in the picture, but you know how you just have that bond with your mom. And when she was gone, it was like, man, that, that messed me up. Like, you know, I just like lost interest in everything. I, I stopped doing music for years. I, it's hard for me to be consistent with stuff because, you know, everything I did was for her. I wanted to I like to see her proud of me and what I'm doing. So everything I was doing, I was just trying to show her that I could be a man and, 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 and make things happen. I would tell her all the time, I'm gonna buy you this, I'm gonna buy you that. She said, I want the biggest kitchen in America. I said, you gonna get that. And, you know, and I was, you know, focused on this music and I was going so hard at one point, just hoping that, you know, something would happen. And, you know, it didn't. And I kind of fell off, got distracted, doing, started doing other things, you know, um, um, out of town, doing things that I didn't need to be doing. And that was stressing her out. You know, she would be like, why are you doing this? You don't need to do this. You know, we don't, we're not you know, that low and, you know, stuff like that. I said, you know, mom, I'm a man now. I'm trying to get some things going for myself. I'm trying to, I'm tired of depending on you. Well, she would be like, you know, I'm, I don't want you to depend on me. I want you to go get a job. I want you to work at the gas company. They make good money. They make $20 an hour and all this and that. But I wasn't trying to do that shit. I wasn't trying to work at no gas company. I wasn't trying to go around reading nobody's meters and shit like that. For people that do it, that's that a job is a job, and I don't knock no job, but I had bigger and better things that I wanted to do for myself. After my dad had passed away, I went and got me my storefront, because I was always famous for making good Kool-Aid. Everybody in my street be buying my Kool-Aid, I be selling it online, I be selling it. People come from all over, San Diego, people come out here from Texas, they come and get like 10 bottles and take home. So, it was so many people coming to my house, I had to get myself a store because I didn't want all these different people just coming to my house. And I got up to selling about three to 400 bottles a day out of my house, like seven days a week, nonstop. So I bought this place right here. Well, I didn't buy it, I leased it. And um, I put my, um, my brand and everything on it, uh, unique flavored juice and sweet treats. I picked out the color schemes. Uh, I had someone come and do the writing over there. Um, come take a look inside.
I remodeled the whole place. Hot up in here. But I remodeled the whole place. All this place was really, really, really tore up. It was uh, dirty. It wasn't clean at all. The paint was messed up. And it was just, it, it wasn't it wasn't nice. So I redid everything. I repainted everything. Uh, got all my machines fixed. Uh, we should be opening up in about the next two weeks. Um, I just got approved from uh, the health department that I'm allowed to open. Uh, I put some pictures on the wall of my history right here. Um, I got a picture of my mom right here, a picture of my dad. And the only reason why I got them here is because I always told them I was going to get this spot and they was going to be here to see it. So since they're not here physically, I had to put them in here, you know, and some pictures of memories, you know. And um, just to, you know, remind myself that, you know, they they, they, they rocking with me. So this is what it is. So make sure y'all check out Unique Flavor Juice and Sweet Treats. We're going to have a grand opening coming soon. Follow me on follow my social media at Big Boss BTO. Uh, if you can type that in, you can, you can pretty much find me, and you'll stay tuned in with everything I got going on. The next five years, I see myself um, out of here, not out of LA, but out of here. We gotta get the fuck from around here, man. I been left. You feel me? I live in Nevada right now, but you know what I'm saying. I'm trying to go farther than that. You know what I mean? I'm trying to expand my horizons. You know what I mean? You know, but I love the hood for some reason. I'd have been all around the world, you know what I'm saying? Miami, New York, DC, wherever. But I always find my place back at home, you know what I'm saying? For real. They gotta check in, they gotta come home. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> but success is the key. So I say in about five years, I should be rich. So own a few businesses, own a couple houses. Um, yeah, five years from now. Next five years, I see myself with a wife, kids, a uh, couple of houses, just like the homie said and shit. I write music, you know, I sing, I rap. Uh, for me, it's all about, you know, the feeling. You know, I'm, I'm putting my money elsewhere too, you know, just to like, you know, just have different facets to be able to bring, you know, revenue streams in. It's just like, especially in California, there's no way to do anything with one stream, you know what I mean? So. Um, also, I have a catering, you know, service from my mom, you know, clothing company, you know, I'm pushing right now, DTLA. So, you know, just trying to pull those things together and, you know, just make it as big as I can, you know, to put back into everybody, you know, I believe in, and, you know, family, friends, you know, myself. Five years, uh, like Cash said, we up out of here, uh, businesses, houses, um, you know, all this stuff, you know, still coming back here, but not having to stay you know want to open up some business around here yeah you know i plan on having plaques you know just be deep in the music game that's well established all right you can find me on instagram at catch up keep up you know i post snippets of beats when we in the studio you know i post all type of stuff soundcloud same thing my shit on all platforms actually it's on uh apple music spotify soundcloud all that shit um just search wapo cats g-u-a-p-o C A S H H. My Instagram, I'll be putting snippets and shit on there too. It's the same thing, but an underscore added to it. Yeah. You know, when we were young, it was one of the things where it's like, you know, the kids over here, the adults over here. You know what I mean? So it's like always something going on. Like they might be playing cards. They may, you know what I mean? Might be shooting dice. It's like, all right, that's over here. Kids go over there. So, you know, me and Tab always came in here in the studio, you know, and just whether, like I said, we was, we was actually recording something or. We was just freestyling to some beats, you know? It's like, I feel like that's where the passion kind of, you know, came for for us both, you know, and really helped us understand, like, deeper into music, you know? Cause it's like, you start to love it, and you're like, damn, I just want to do music, you know? But then it comes to a point where it's like, nah, I'm gonna do music. I don't know what it takes, you know? I don't know, like, what it, what it you know, I have to do to, to be what I want to be and make sure my music is heard, but I'm gonna do what I have to do, you know what I mean? And it's like it just fell in. But I feel like the best part is like looking back at looking back at it now to see like how we all still together. You know what I mean? I feel like that's that's different with like a lot of other situations, you know what I mean? A lot of people don't don't have this they can lean on, you know what I mean? To be able to come and chill and still be in your, be yourself, like 
I've been in a lot of studios, man, and it's like even just, you know, being in studios, you still want to be able to feel like yourself and, you know what I mean, and be able to chill rather than, oh, damn, it's come to, come to do business. It's like you want that business feel, but also like, man, fuck that shit, let's have fun. You know, so it's like, you know, doing that and still knowing like, man, we're going to get this money together and we all going to be here. That shit, that's the best feeling, bro. It's the best feeling. Everybody took penitentiary chances to get what they need to uh, get and survive. Most of everybody in my family are felons. I'm not gonna say every single body, but you know, I have. A, there are a lot of felons, you know, in my um, family. My dad was a felon. My mom was a felon. My brothers were felons. You know, one of them were. And I have a brother in prison right now. He's doing 50 to life. So he's doing. Uh, he's been in jail ever since uh, 03. I believe 03, 03, 03, or something like that, 04, something like around that time. But he's been in there a long time, and um, he has 50 to life. And, you know, my mom, she tried to do everything she could to get him out of prison, get him an appeal, get him this, get him that, anything that could possibly get him out of prison. But, you know, unfortunately, a lot of that, a lot of that stuff didn't happen, and it didn't happen before she passed. She, like, literally killed herself every day trying to... You know, uh, make sure her kids were good, and all that stress just builds up, and then eventually you can't you can't take no more because you are trying to um, stop, or you're trying to turn around what God has planned. And when you try to do that, you know it's gonna be stressful because that ain't what it, that's not what it meant was what's meant to be. And his situation, I pray that he gets out, and I know that he will get out, but. It's all on God's time. So this is my boy Zulo right here. Let me tell you, yeah, Zulo. Zulo been around this neighborhood. I've been over here since 1994. You've been over here how long? Years. From what date? Can't you can't remember. <laughs> but, any, but anyway, look, Zulo recorded my first song, my first rap song. Like every, any, before I even recorded anything, Zulo right here was the first person to put it on uh, a disc and let me hear it back. Let South me, Central Healing. South that Central Hill. That's the song he had put me on. I spit my little verse. I was 10 years old. You know what I'm saying? So thanks to him, you know what I'm saying? This kept me out the streets and, you know what I'm saying, kept me busy. Because if I never really wouldn't have heard myself that day, I don't know what I would have been right now. That part right there. Now check this out, man. We've been doing this since way back in the days, man. When we get back on top of this, we're going to drop South Central Hill in again. We're going to do the remix. Yay, yay. Make sure y'all follow us on Instagram. This is Zulo right here. Follow me at Big Boss BTO. And uh, I appreciate y'all for tuning in, man. This is it, man. Let me know how y'all like it. That part. Yep, our favorite viral celebrity at home cook, Annie Fee. Uh, Annie Fee, you there? Yes, I'm here. Well, how, how you been? Oh, I don't know what you got going on here, but I'm here at these people's house. And you know, you sent me to these people's house to cook uh -huh. and to be your ambassador and to um, do some memories, leave some memories. Hell, make some memories. How about that? <laughs> Yeah, make some memories. How about that? You ready to surprise Chris and the kids? Steve, I can't wait to find out what the <laughs> you done did. Okay, I don't even know what you're saying. You know where you're sitting. You know where you're sitting up in here, right? I ain't never even seen a dog like this. Just be yourself, Annie Fee. And let's just see how it goes. Go for it. Knock on the door, and then as soon as you knock on the door, you got to tell them I'm here first, though. Okay. But you know this is on you, don't you? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Knock on. Go ahead, Annie Fee. Go ahead. This is so good. You don't even understand how good this is. Hi. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> what are you doing? You're standing on my How door. are you? How are you? <laughs> oh, we, 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 we are the mother. Well, well, honey, you, you got to move and let me in here, because I come in and... Just tell her I'm here. Hey, I just yeah. told you... I got you. Steve on the phone and the camera and everything, okay? Tell her I'm here. Okay. Tell her okay. it's me. I just told it's you... Steve Harvey sent me out here. Okay, kids, come on in here. The Steve Harvey show is here. No, no. no. Steve Harvey sent me. He's yeah, no. Here. Okay. He, he ain't no. my ear. Whatever that means, okay? <laughs> tell her, tell her to look at the camera. How are you, mama? How are you, Tell her to look at the camera. Tell them that I okay. sent you. Hey, Campbell family, this is Steve Harvey. How you doing? Hey, he says, how you doing? Okay, good. Hey, kids, listen. You said you wanted some help getting the whole family together for a meal, so surprise, I bought you Annie Fee. You're in for the shock of your lives. <laughs>
So, Annie Fee, ask Chris what made okay. her reach out but for help. He want me to ask you what made you reach out to me, to well, him. Tell you. I'm sure. Excuse me, y'all. <laughs> okay. I am the mom to He's... these four kids, and I work full time as a special education teacher. And Claire has going That's off Claire. to college. Hello. And Scott is an avid Sorry. golfer, practices all the time, plays lots of tournaments. Julia, this is my singing actress, and she wants to move out to L.A. And then Anna, my baby, is involved in lots of extracurricular activities. And we never have time to sit down and eat a meal together. And Steve, I just want to make more memories with these kids before everybody goes off to college and lives their own life. Okay, Annie Fee, what's your plan for the Campbells? We gonna cook some <laughs> You already know that. We going to eat. Not eat no <laughs> We gonna eat some good stuff. And okay. then, yeah. That's what we gonna do. And then, and, and then Annie Fee, at, right after that, we gonna put the kids in therapy. <laughs> no, no, I ain't going to. Oh, we, I said, we are going to make some memories. Up in this bitch. <laughs> oh, no, Steve, I can't tell you. I don't know what you did. I can't keep doing this, okay? But I'm going to tell you, you set me up in here. Yeah. And you know what you were setting up in here. Yeah. So, y'all, I'm going to rebuke myself three times right now because you set me up in here. So, y'all better be ready. I don't know, Mama, look, I'm going to apologize now. Okay. So, this is going to be some mess. Oh, what okay. you did, Steve? Hey, have fun. Okay. We're going to check back in a little while. This is going to be the best thing I've ever done on daytime TV. <laughs> Success is, 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 is a lot, man. It takes a lot, you know, and a lot of people over here don't, you know, see success as, oh, I'm working a job, a nine to five every day, I'm buying things, I'm, you know, I got this, I got that. That's not success to a lot of people. That's just, oh, I'm, I don't want to work, for, that's working for somebody else. Some people feel like if they can sell drugs and make um, $100,000, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars a year, they feel like, okay, you're doing something. And then you got some people that feel like they can pimp and pimp forever, but how long can you do that? You know, you eventually, you get old and you lose your touch and then, you know, you didn't got all this money, but you didn't do nothing with it. And now you are 50 and 60 trying to, still trying to pimp, but it's not like that. You know, the, the game has changed. The, 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 the women are smarter. The, you know, everything is just done different. And when you try to con continue with the old ways, it doesn't work for you. So, you know, um, my mom, like I said, she was just a go-getter. She just, you know, if she gonna do it, she do it. But, um, like I said, we don't have, we didn't have many options coming up over here. Everybody that grows up over here kind of like goes down the same path. And it's either you're gonna be successful at it or you're not. Listen on the past and all the pain and hurt. So I came a long way, I knew this shit would work. It's my time, I'ma milk this shit for what it's worth. I had to suffer through the pain and get my out the dirt. Reminiscing on the past and all the pain and hurt. So I came a long way, I knew this shit would work. I remember all them times I was doing hella bad. Had to get up off my ass, hit the streets and get some cash. Always said I was a boss, remember niggas used to laugh. Used to count a couple hundred, now I count it by the stack. I be really in the trenches with them demons, that's facts. Bitch, I get it out the I'm getting no money from this rap. Bitches blowing up my phone, bugging, wondering where I'm at. Bitch, I'm